Hello, everyone. Um, I hope um, this event finds you well, wherever you are in the world. Um, we're in the East Coast in the United States. It's noon. Uh, but if you are in Europe, other parts, you're probably in your afternoon, evening, 6 p.m. time frame. But we welcome all of you. Thank you. Um, yes. So I'm just going to go over a little bit about uh, the purpose of this event. I want to welcome you to the Inspire and Empower Global Webcast for Women in Science. This panel is it's jointly uh, co-organized by IEEE, as uh, Gary was just mentioned, GRS IDEA, which stands for Inspire, Develop, Empower, and Advance Committee. And also WISE, uh, many of you have probably heard about this group as well, Women in Science, Engineering, and Environment. This panel is formed by diverse international women in STEM fields, working in a variety of sectors, but most import importantly, they are forming supportive networks in the face of adversity. The pandemic has increased the gap and disparities among women and underserved communities. And our purpose is to develop a virtual global conversation to discuss issues in diversity, equity, and inclusion among women leaders in science with the purpose of informing equipment and inspiring other women to aspire higher. We have three outstanding panelists today and a photo video contest planned for the next 90 minutes. You will get to meet the panelists, ask them questions after the third panelists will have like 10 minutes of Q&A. If you are joining us, please tell us in the chat room your name and what are you connecting from? For audio quality, please mute yourself and just unmute if you have a question for the speaker during the Q&A. Um, after you know, describing how we're going to uh, run this panel, I would like to introduce our first panelist, Professor Soda Erami. Uh, she's a Moroccan lecturer and researcher with a strong academic background in earth sciences fields and over 17 years of experience in international geoscientific professional organizations. She's currently the Dean of Polydisciplinary Faculty at Safi Kadiyat University in Morocco. Her current major research interests are in petroleum, petrology, geochemistry, structural geology, geoheritage, geotourism, geoeducation, sustainable development, and gender-related studies in geosciences. She's serving in so many leadership positions in international networks that I could be all day just listening, listening them, okay? So I just wanna let you know that. Throughout her activities, she is aggressively promoting numerous principles that she believes in especially peace for sustainable socioeconomic development, regional and international integration, scientific ethics, and she believes in the importance of human dimension in all scientific related activities. Um, I would like to now introduce Farsan Mohammed, since she, he is behind the technology and video production for this event, and he has recently graduated from University of Maryland College Park with a bachelor degree in computer science. So for some, can you please show the first video for our first panelists? Thanks. Hello everyone, my name is Isora Rami. I am the Dean of the Polydisciplinary Faculty of uh, Safi that belongs to Kadiriyad University, Morocco. My faculty consists of 11 departments, including five dedicated to STEM. Why I choose Earth Science? 
I think first because of my contact with nature and uh, they grew up in a salt manufactory, but also because I believe that earth science are important for a sustainable world. The female scientist and as a lecturer researcher in a male dominated Jewish department, I think that I have the feeling that I have to work harder, to be stronger, to do better constantly. As a dean, I am facing numerous challenges. Some lecturers, mainly males, have difficulties accepting a woman dean. I am doing a huge amount of work in all fields, but the main challenge is the lack of recognition. Fortunately, I learned to work by conviction and they do not wait for recognition. As I'm convinced that I'm contributing to the change and I'm giving the example for a future generation. I think that the advantage that I have that allowed me to, to overcome the challenges I'm facing is that I love working hard, helping others, standing for right things, for what I believe in, it helped me a lot. But I can say sometimes it's exhausting. I think that the number of women scientists is still low because of educational inequality. Despite all the actions taken, many still believe that women are less worthy for the same educational opportunities afforded to men. Poverty, patriarchy and many other factors contribute to huge disparities in education between girls and boys. We are seeing that poor households, especially in rural areas, give more opportunities to males to go to school than females. To narrow this gap, I think that government should make educational obligatory for males and especially for females until 18 years old. I think first a young woman should know that science is for everyone, for women and for men. There is no exclusiveness. This is why girls and young women that dream to do science should make their dream come true. They should keep in mind that nothing is impossible. They have to believe in themselves and to be self-confident, persevering and patient. Also to have the right mentor is very important and could be very helpful. They have to compare themselves to women successful stories. Girls and young women should set objectives and give themselves the means to achieve them. They should not wait for others to create opportunities for them. They have to lead and create their own opportunities. Senior women scientists should give the example. They should share their experience. They should mentor young women. They should begin with the, 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 their girls and also the girls of their families and friends. This is really very important. We should be optimistic. Things are improving. However, there is still a lot of work that should be done by societies, families, and decision makers to reach equity in all fields and not just in science. Thank you very much. An outstanding video, Professor Rami. So I would like to ask you as, uh, several questions um, uh, after chatting with you and, and understanding better your background. I think uh, uh, the attendees will really enjoy getting to know more about you. Can you please tell us how your dad influenced you and the role that he played in developing a passion on you for soils. Thank you, Anna. Thank you for the invitation. Hello, everybody. Uh, I think that... Um, sorry, I have a problem. Are you hearing me? Yes. Okay. I, my, fa my father played a key role in my education, I think, which is uh, normal, but he really made the education of his daughters a priority. He was always encouraging us, pushing us to give the best of ourselves in order to reach our objectives. Um, he was always telling us that um, girls' education protects them from numerous problems that could arise during their lives and allows them to make the right decision at the right moment. And I am sure that he was right. Uh, concerning my choice of geoscience and earth science, as I said in the video, I think that is related to the fact that I, that I grew up in a salt factory 
where my father was working. Uh, when I was a kid, I was uh, looking to do, to do, I was contemplating the crystals of salt and I was trying to, exp to, to explain to myself and to understand how they, 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 are, they, they, they form. And I think this is what pushed me to, 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 to choose uh, geoscience in order to, in this, to understand more what is happening in this salt factory. Mm -hmm. Very interesting. Now, what advice do you have for younger or early careers in the Southern Hemisphere or developing countries where uh, the, 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 the number of opportunities and resources and scholarships are very limited? What, what advice do you have for them? I think um, the same advice that I give in the, the video, I think it's very, there is, there is a difference between the Southern and the Northern Hemisphere concerning women opportunities, but the same advices are, uh, first, the women, they, sh they should, if, if they, they would like to, 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 to choose science, they have to do it. This is very important. And then they have to, 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 to find the, the means to reach their objectives. As I said in the video, nothing is impossible. If they don't have means, they have, they, there are more uh, uh, opportunities at the international level. Uh, for example, for myself, I, um, I did my bachelor in, in Morocco, but for my PhD uh, thesis, I have got a DAD scholarship from Germany and I did my PhD between Morocco and Germany and it was very helpful for me, not just for science, but also to, to, to have, a, to have a, another experience in a northern country, which is very important, and also in a northern laboratory to have access to, uh, to more elaborated uh, uh, material to do my research. And also there, there are a lot of networks at the international level concerning earth sciences, uh, especially the International Union of Geological Science, our association, for example, the African Association of Women in Geoscience is given a lot of, a lot of opportunity to promote uh, women in earth sciences. But women, they have, they have to, 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 to try to, 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 to find these opportunities. They exist, but they have to 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 uh, to give to themselves the opportunity to 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 evolve in science at at the local level, but also at the continental level and at the international level. I think that um, the most important thing that women should uh, have objectives and also to try to to reach them. This is what I. Uh, I am not uh, willing to repeat the same uh, advices that I give in the video, but I think it's very important to, to be self-confident, persevering, patient, hard work, hard, hard work, uh, work, worker. There is no magic, ma magic solution for that. Hard work is, can, can pay and pay, is, is paying at every moment, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So once you told me that, one, that you are constantly fighting for something that you can define, why aiming to be better? Why is that important to you? Yes, I, I think that I have the feeling that I have to work harder, to be stronger, to be better constantly as a woman. I really i don't really know why but um, uh, i have asked myself this question many times i think that i have to show to as a woman that i am able to meet challenges that i am able to set objectives and to reach them to whom should i sh show that i think first to myself this is what makes me gaining more self confidence why it is important for me, um, I think that by doing that, I am contributing to change and also I'm giving the example for future generation. I think it's very important for me. Very nice.
definitely as a role model. And why do you consider education is more important for girls than men? Why so? I mean, you mentioned a little bit in the beginning about um, the legacy of your father and how he educated you, but I would like to know your perspective about this. Um, yeah, uh, well, I, I think that education is important for men and women. Uh, however, educating a woman benefits to a community more than educating a man, and it has a multiplier effect in all fields, social, economical, health, human development. And I would like to remind the proverb that it has a sense for me is if you educate a man, you educate a person, but if you educate a woman, you educate a nation. Another uh, poet, uh, his name is Hafid Ibrahim, who lived uh, during the last uh, half of the 19th century and also the beginning of the 20th century. He said, a mother is a school. If, edu if you educate her well, you educate a nation with good roots. And it has a sense for me. Um, I think investing in women education is um, investing to make a community wealthier. And the reverse is also true. Women are agents of change in their families, communities, and countries. And without educated women, it, it is impossible to reach the Millennium Development Goals set by uh, the, nation, the United Nations. And uh, I think that even with low education levels, women have healthier and more educated children, better socioeconomic impact on their communities and so on. So, um, and women are educating men. Women are mothers, are sisters, are uh, teachers, are many things in, in, in the communities. And they are really impacting uh, the change in their societies. Very good. All right. Well, we're going to then now move into the second panelist. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor Rami, for your Thank you input. to Anna. Thank you to yes. Anna. And now, uh, Stephanie Spy. Um, do we have a Stephanie here with us? I know I've seen her earlier. Hi, Stephanie. All right, I'm going to start introducing you. So, Stephanie Spy was born and raised in Decatur, Georgia. After graduating from high school, Stephanie attended MIT. She majored in chemical engineering and minor in theater arts, driven to apply for her problem solving skills to the production of real world technologies. Stephanie worked as an engineer for a multinational oil and gas company called BP. Many of you probably know this company. So these experiences further open uh, Stephanie's eyes to, to the field of STEM and convince her that if more students realize that math and science are modes of perception and not just subjects of a study, innovation gaps will no longer exist. To activate this new insight, she created and coached uh, a program to engage middle and high school students in connecting their STEM studies to the real world. The Stephanie's mission is to motivate, inspire, and prepare math SP students to excel in the STEM fields and academic subjects and on college and graduation, uh, graduate admission exams. Um, welcome, Stephanie. Uh, we're gonna go ahead and show your video. For some, please, can you show Stephanie's video? My name is Stephanie Espy. I'm a chemical engineer, the author of STEM Gems, and the founder of Math SP. 
I grew up in Decatur, Georgia, which is a small town outside of Atlanta. I have three siblings, and it just so happens that I was raised by a mother who happens to be a chemical engineer and a father who happens to be an electrical engineer. So STEM and math and science were areas that my parents were passionate about. They helped us to develop a passion for math and science as well, just through our daily lives. So for example, my father, the electrical engineer, would have my siblings and I go outside and help help them do things like fix the car, for example. Uh, you learn a lot of physics through cars and things that he didn't necessarily say this is physics, but he definitely helped us understand some of the key concepts of physics. And so that was just one example. My mother, a chemical engineer, she loves to cook and cooking is a lot of chemistry. It's also a lot of math and she also loves math. So she would cook and she would have my siblings and I to help. And in helping her, we would, you know, do different measurements and talk about proportions and ratios. and so. So my parents did a very natural job at infiltrating math and science concepts into just everyday life for my siblings and I. As I became an adult, I realized how much of a privilege it is and was to have the family that I had who valued education, who valued math and science. That was one of the many reasons I decided to write the STEM Gems book because I realized that a lot of my friends and a lot of people don't have that sort of motivation and inspiration, right? at home. And so I wanted to give girls role models. I wanted to make sure that every girl had a role model in STEM that was somebody they could look up to and somebody they can see themselves as. And so that is one of the reasons that I decided to showcase women in STEM in the form of a book to share a plethora of role models that they can look up to. Because a lot of the women that are in the STEM gym book are women that did not have that same background that I had. I think it's important for girls and young women to have role models, to have mentors, and to read lots of books like the STEM gyms book where you can really see, read stories about women and understand their paths to where they got to, and then see how you can create your own path and take their advice and their guidance. So that that's sort of exactly why I wanted to share this book with the world because I just felt like I was very honored and privileged to have the influence I had growing up. Excellent. So Stephanie, I have some questions for you. So some people believe that when you ask for help, you show weakness, yet you advise women not to be afraid to ask for help. Why? Can you tell us a little bit about your experience? Sure. Yeah. Um, so I, um, I guess I, I first start to feel a um, knowledge gap or very um, confused in my studies when I got to college. And so, you know, in high school, I always excelled in, in my classes, especially in my math and science classes. Um, and then when I got to college, and you mentioned um, in, my, in the introduction that I attended MIT for undergraduate school. And so when I got there as a freshman for the first time, I, I felt like, man, I thought I was so smart. And now I'm really starting to be confused by um, different you know, subjects and different concepts. And um, for a while, I thought it was just me. I thought I was the only one sitting there confused. I mean, you know, it was particularly, it was specifically my physics class, my freshman year physics class. And I didn't have physics in high school. So I came at a bit of a disadvantage because, um, because I had never seen the subject before where other peers had seen the subject in high school. So, um, but I just sat in the classroom and I just was very confused as to what um, the professor was explaining. And so um, for a while, again, I thought it was just me and I thought maybe, you know, I'm not smart enough or this is maybe not the right um, major for me or maybe I should do something different. You know, all these kind of thoughts into your head. And um, and so, you know, it came to a point where um, I had to get help. I mean, there was no way around it. Like I, if I didn't get the help and the help was offered, it was like, you know, office hours, the TA and all these people here to help. But I never took advantage of any of that because I always felt like if I did, I would be perceived as, you know, um, you know, not smart enough. And so um, and I wasn't used to asking for help. I had really never asked for serious help before this point. So, um, but yeah, I, I kind of had to humble myself and, and seek help for in that particular class. 
Um, and then I learned that I was not the only one that needed help. And so all the kids in class that I thought were so smart and like naturally gifted and they just got it, you know, they were also in office hours. So I was like, wow, like I was shocked to see so many people here, especially the ones that I thought were, um, were geniuses, you know? So it, it humbled me, but it was, it was an important part of my, um, of my education and of my journey and, and understanding that it's not only okay to ask for help, but like is necessary, right? To get the help you need to get to the next level. Um, sitting somewhere confused, not speaking up, not asking questions is only doing a disservice to yourself. Um, and the sooner you learn it's okay to be vocal and to um, raise your hand and seek the help, the, the easier your journey will be and, and more pleasant as well. So um, it took me a while to get to that point, but um, I, I eventually got there and felt pretty secure. <laughs> and, um, and, you know, that's the trajectory, not only in that one class, but through other classes as well, as well as into the workplace, as well as into my adult life. You know, I'm constantly seeking advice, asking for help to this day. And I think that's just, um, very important because you know we can't do it all alone and we don't have all the information ourselves so um so that was sort of a, a big learning lesson for me at the time and something that um you know I feel like is really important for um women especially because a lot of times women are afraid to to ask a question because they think it's a silly question or they believe that um you know they'll be made fun of or they'll be deemed as not good enough and you know we let our thoughts live in our heads and we tell ourselves these things and we internalize these things we believe that to be true but in fact they're not and so you know if you have a question or you're struggling with something or need help i think that one there's other people around you that also need that same help and so you're not the only one um and so, you know, how many times have you been in a room and somebody asked a question and you were thinking that same question and you were so happy that they, they said it because you didn't have to say it, right? <laughs> somebody has to say it. You must be brave enough <laughs> to say it or ask it because other people may be thinking it as well. So that was, yeah. Um, yeah, that was a lesson that I learned my first year in college. There is, Stephanie. Yeah, you are totally right. <laughs> Who hasn't been in a situation in which you need help? And it's just sometimes it's about um accepting and, and not uh, associating us for help with weakness right uh we're humans so yeah now let me ask you another question how did you identify your purpose in life and the type of impact you wanted to have through your career because you definitely did not follow the traditional chemical engineer path career path so at what point and how? I mean, there are millions of folks around the world trying to figure out what is their purpose in life. And then based on that, then, you know, uh, choose uh, that dream position or at least identify what's their dream position or career, you know. Um, can you explain a little bit about the process that you follow and how it worked for you? You know, it wasn't a process. It was more just listening to, um, listening to the thoughts in my head in terms of um, uh, what I felt like the universe was telling me I need to do. So, you know, I um, studied in college. I did lots of internships in chemical engineering. That was definitely my path. That was definitely my plan. I never envisioned anything else except for being a chemical engineer. Um, I got a chance to move to London and I got a chance to work um, in, um, outside of London for a little while and that was exciting and, and then I went to graduate school so I came back to the States and went to UC Berkeley for graduate school and I was studying chemical engineering in graduate school and that was exciting I was doing research and that was exciting and you know all these things that again my plan up until a certain point was to be a chemical engineer until I retired. Um, but also along the way, I realized that in so many environments I was in, I was the only woman and definitely the only woman of color, um, only African-American woman. Sometimes, um, you know, a lot of times I was the only, right? And so um, it always felt like, um, to me, it always was like, why? You know, why, why is it that there are so few women in the room or so few um, people of color? Um, why aren't more people... Um, you know, choosing to pursue 
you know, similar career. I felt like it was a very rewarding, exciting work. Um, so why are, why is it you this huge gender gap that, you know, you hear about, but then you experience it. And so it's just this feeling of like this, this question of why. And as I experienced that time after time after time, both in the classroom, as well as in the internships that I had, as well as in, in graduate school, as well as in full-time positions, um, it always sort of like, um, you know, it was just a question that I, I just could not figure out why. And so it was, a, it came a point where I decided to um, um, kind of do something about that. And I asked myself, what can I, what can I do? You know, why is it that I had an affinity towards engineering, but, you know, so many other Black women, women in general, don't. And it all stems back to my early childhood and the things that I did growing up, the influence of my parents, the inspiration of my family, um, my teachers, you know, lots of things early on that really influenced my desire to study engineering. And so I said, well, if I want to make a difference in this in this way, I have to go back to those ages and I have to directly impact girls at those ages so that they can see the beauty in STEM that I saw so they can have good experiences in math and science like I did. So ultimately I decided to get an MBA um, and it was even, even then it wasn't a huge desire of mine. It was, it was definitely like a pressing thing in my head, but I still was like on this corporate um, engineering path, just now combining business skills with engineering skills. But then after I experienced what I consider my dream job, um, and it, don't, it, it actually turned out to not, to, you know, what I thought was my dream job turned out not to be my dream job. Um, I finished my MBA and I decided to um, pursue um, my own path in entrepreneurship. And that essentially what that decision was made just from years and years and years of kind of thinking about certain experiences I've had and thinking about this gender gap and thinking about, you know, the critical early, year, early years and how impactful they are they were to my decision as well as other people's decisions around me and trying to influence um, early on the pathway that people take. So it's all about exposure and it's all about um, um, what you see. And if you, if you know, you can't be it, if, if you don't see it, you can't be it, right? So that's sort of why I chose this path of more on the education side of things. So as a STEM educator, I'm able to really impact um, so many students and I'm able to share with them all things STEM and all things engineering and different types of careers they can do and introduce them to lots of different mentors and role models and just get them excited and get them to consider um, choosing a STEM pathway as well. So I mentioned the STEM Gems book in the video. So that essentially mm -hmm. was, you know, it just started with a simple book. Like I'm going to write this book and in this book, I'm going to share amazing careers and amazing women. And I'm going to inspire so many people to, you know, read this book. You're going to read it. You're going to want to study engineering as well. So this is the book. I went and grabbed a copy of it earlier. So I was like, through this book, I'm going to change so many people's lives. You know, they're going <laughs> to, they're, they're going to want to do these things too. Um, and then once it was, you know, took, it took three, four years to finish it. So it was, sort of like getting a PhD, that's what it felt like anyway, a lot of research. Um, but once it was all said and done, then it was, um, then it was like, okay, this is great. You know, parents can buy it and, you know, you can give it to their kids and they can read it. They can read it together, they can read it by themselves. But I felt like I had much more of an impact when you actually put curriculum around it and make it more of a, um, a learning tool, uh, incorporate it into the classroom or incorporate it into, um, a youth organization or community group. So then I built a curriculum around it and I built summer camps around it. And I built um, a whole conference around it. So, you know, it kind of started having its own legs and it kind of stuck building and building and building and building. So that's, you know, that became the full time for me is just really trying to mentor and inspire as many girls as I possibly can to um, choose a STEM pathway so we can get closer to um, parity when it comes to women in STEM. Well, let me tell you, Stephanie, I continue seeing a lot of folks, you know, wearing your t-shirts or, you know, having material from your organization. I think you're extremely, extremely well known, um, you know, at least in the U.S., right? All right, let's <laughs> proceed. Let's proceed. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. So being a mother, and, and let me just first say my daughter is um, eight years old. She's a third grader. And, um, you know, definitely having a child changes your life as every parent, you know, knows. Um, but for me, it's been, you know, it's, it's interesting because I think about my parents and I think about how I was raised um, and what they did for me. And I feel like I had excellent parents. So, you know, first it was really trying to mimic, <laughs> you know, just do the bare minimum, do what, what was done for me to my own child, right? So um, give her lots of experiences, you know, not just tangible things and items, you know, but actual experiences, take her different places, show her different things. Um, and, and also I do, I feel like I do somewhat of what my parents did for me and my siblings, but I also do kind of things that I wish I had, right. Things that I, you know, if I could go back and change it, I would have done this differently. So let me make sure that I do it for her. Um, so for example, um, speaking another language, right? So I only speak English. I took a little bit of Spanish in high school, but not fluent, but she's fluent in Spanish. And she's been fluent, or well, she started speaking when she was three and she's eight now. So things like that, um, very intentional, making sure that she has different types of experiences and exposures, um, again, based on what I, how I was raised as well as based on um, things that I've seen and read and experience and kind of passing that off to her. So wanting her to be a better version of me in some way. Um, and, and STEM is definitely a big part of, you know, my parenting. Um, one thing my parents did really well is, if, like I said in the video, infiltrate um, math and science into everyday life, um, from cooking to cleaning to um, cutting the grass, grocery shopping, whatever. And I try to do the same thing with her so that it doesn't feel like, you know, homework or it doesn't feel like a chore. It feels like this is our natural conversation. Um, this is real life. These are applications of what, you know, how you can use math and science. So um, yeah, I think that's, that's, I just try to be, try to be a very intentional parent, um, try to offer different things into her life to give her different experiences and exposure and definitely want her to, um, think about different ways she can improve the world around her. So identify issues and, and problems that, that she personally is affected by. And, and we come up with solutions and things that she can do to, um, you know, to make a difference in, in, in a small way. So that's sort of my parenting style. And I mean, very present um, and very hands-on. Mm -hmm. Now, what did you say, what would you say to young women who don't have a lot of money, but wants to get, they want to get a STEM education? What kind of tips or advice do you have for them? Not a lot of money to want a STEM education. So there are tons and tons and tons of foundations and grants and scholarships out there to um, help with that, with that pathway. So as one of four children, you know, my parents have you know, endless money to send us to four different, you know, colleges or whatnot. So it was important for, for me to apply for scholarships. So when I was in high school, I spent a lot of time researching and applying for different scholarships. And so what, what allowed me to go to um, college, um, a very expensive college was a combination of scholarships, a combination of um, scholarships combined with um, work study and I had some some um, some loans as well. I had a little bit of parent contribution, but the majority of it was scholarships. Um, and then when I applied to graduate school, I, I got scholarships for that as well. So actually, my graduate program was completely free. I didn't pay anything. In fact, I got a stipend. So they paid me to go to graduate school, which was amazing. So there's lots of different ways where you can pursue your dreams at very little to no cost with um because there's many people out there and organizations and foundations that are trying to help, especially if you're um, a woman, especially if you're a person of color, knowing that there's a huge gap, um, there's programs and, and, and initiatives to try to bring in more. Um, so it just takes a little bit of research to figure out, you know, where those what kind of programs are out there, what you can qualify for. Um, there's, of course, community colleges, two-year colleges, there's um, boot camps, there's lots of different ways to kind of get started 
And then as you learn about more opportunities, you can then, you know, seek the next kind of level, but it's just a, a journey. Um, and it just starts with research and the internet makes it pretty easy, you know, back, back in, in high school for us, you know, we didn't have that, that way to communicate and that way to research um, like we do now. So just taking advantage of the web and doing research and figuring out ways to achieve your dreams. Indeed, it's a journey, Stephanie. Thank you so much for all your insights. Uh, we're going to be moving into the third and last panelist, Silvia Pepoloni. Uh, Silvia has a PhD in geology and is a researcher at the Italian Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology. Her scientific activity concerns geohazards, georisk, social geosciences. She's an international leader of geoethics, fully involved in the base research on ethical, social, and cultural aspects of geosciences. Silvia is also currently the consul the Counselor of the International Union of Geological Sciences, Secretary General of the International Association for Promoting Geoethics, Director of the School of Geoethics and Natural Issues, Editor-in-Chief of the Spring Brief on Geoethics. She's also a science writer for Italian newspaper and magazines and has been recognized in Italy for her impact on science communication and natural literature. Welcome, Sylvia. We're going to go ahead and watch your video. First, Sam, please. Good morning. My name is Silvia Peppoloni. I was born in Rome, Italy and I am a geologist. Since I was a child, I was driven by a great curiosity to understand how the world worked. In particular, I was fascinated by the power of geological phenomena. And so, even if I was keen on music and studied piano and singing since, since childhood, the desire to understand the causes behind the earth dynamics was so strong that at the end of high school, I chose to study geosciences. After graduating with the full marks at La Sapienza University in Rome, I received a PhD in earth sciences and perfected my skills with a master's in quaternary geology. And from 1999, I work as a researcher at the Italian Institute of Geophysics and Volcanology. My research activities cover the fields of engineering geology, natural hazards and risks, and social aspects of earth sciences, including their communication and dissemination to society. Moreover, from about uh, 15 years, I'm fully involved in basic research on geoethics, focusing on ethical, social and cultural implication of geoscience, knowledge, research and practice. Among my work experiences, I was professor of applied geology and geotechnics at the University of Rome La Sapienza in PhD courses on landscape and environment and on disaster risk reduction. Ten years ago I founded the International Association for Promoting Geoethics, a scientific network that today has members in 128 countries. I'm currently Councillor of the International Union of Geological Sciences, Chair of the Ethical Advisory Board of the European Research Infrastructure, ICOS, and Member of the Standing Committee for Gender Equality of the International Science Council. I'm involved with the different roles in several European projects. I'm Editor-in-Chief of the new editorial Springer serious in geoethics and recently I was appointed as director of the School on Geoethics and Natural Issues. Finally, I devote part of my time to the activity of science writer as contributor of Italian newspaper and magazines and as author of scientific books intended for the general public. And in 2017, I was awarded with the Italian prize for naturalistic literature. Working in science has meant for me a gradual growth of awareness 
over time I have learned that science is a valuable tool in our hands and as humans we have the responsibility to use scientific knowledge with intelligence and wisdom. And even if science has many limits and does not offer us full certainties, it represents an irreplaceable help for our life and this is the main motivation that pushes me in my work. Welcome, Sylvia. Thank you for inviting me, Anna. Oh, no, no, Morning, no. It's everybody. It's to have you. Um, so many questions. Okay, so let's start with, please tell us about your fascination for volcanoes <laughs> and how you think you are serving the society in a critical era for climate change. Yes, I, I have always been fascinated by the power of natural phenomena. They terrified and attracted me at the same time. And in particular, my passion for volcanoes comes back to my childhood when I used to listen astonished for hours to my grandfather telling stories of uh, Vesuvius volcano. I remember uh, he had a strange object that uh, seemed uh, almost magic to me, a stereoscopic viewer in which I could insert a double slide and, uh, and see three dimensional images of Vesuvius. Moreover, I remember I was struck by images on television in occasion of earthquakes, the people upset, helpless, looking at the rubble, uh, the statue of the Madonna carried in possession, and, and so on. Going on in my studies, I began to understand that those events from, from which I felt that there was no possibility of escape could be investigated and studied by science. Science could give me answers on their causes, or at least help me to understand if there was a way to defend myself from them. Uh, well, these were the circumstances that contributed to arousing in me my desire to discover the deep origin of the Earth's uh, force and to become a geologist. And over time I have learned that even if science has many limits, uh, as I said in the video, uh, science does not offer full certainties. Despite this, it is a great tool in our hands to be used to responsibly serve society. Geoscientists have the particular ability to transform the knowledge of the past in tools to find solutions to current problems and to foresee the, the future evolution of a place, the probability of an, an event occurring. So I don't see a profession more suitable, more capable of guiding the progress of our societies and even of supporting a change, if necessary, in such a critical moment as the one we are experiencing today. Climate mm. change and more generally current global anthropogenic changes require the maximum commitment by Earth experts, by those who know Earth processes and so are able to guide political and economic decisions that can greatly affect people's lives, the environment, the survival of our and many other species on the planet. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Now, can you please share with the audience how you develop a new area, geoethics, and how you turn a bad experience into a positive outcome? Yes, going on in my, in my activity, I was increasingly convincing that science needs to be supported by a reference framework of ethical values to increase our awareness and sense of responsibility towards the earth and future generations. And this is what geoethics is carrying out. This is what I tried and I'm trying to do by developing a geoethical thinking. 
Unfortunately, when I started to develop uh, geoethics uh, around 15 years ago, I had to face a nasty situation. I would say a real action of uh, bullying. My scientific activity began to, to annoy a senior scientist and his uh, collaborators who perceived my interest in the field as a, a threat, a, an interference in what they probably considered their own exclusive field of study. In particular, the senior scientists started to, to defame my reputation worldwide with false accusation to threaten me uh, to write uh, dozens of mails uh, every day addressed to the most prominent professor all over the world they, uh, to phone me also in the night and so on. Uh, he arrived so far as to write a letter to the court which was judging the L'Aquila earthquake case where seven Italian scientists were accused of negligence during the phases before the earthquake, accusing me that I was using geoethics to renew the image of my institute and my president who was one of the accused scientists. This persecution went on for years in the complete silence and sometimes with the, the connivance of his closer collaborators, a real psychological harassment that transformed my life in a hell. But I can assure you that he was so aggressive towards me also because I am a woman. If I had been a man, I'm sure that guy, that guy and his friends would not have allowed themselves to attack me like that. Unfortunately, a woman can appear weaker and therefore easier to be attacked. Mm -hmm. Woman kindness can be mistaken for weakness. In fact, I did not have the courage to denounce him in front of the scientific community because of a sort of respect for his old age. My fault was starting to develop my own ideas in geoethics, a field that he believed to be of his exclusive competence. At that mm -hmm. time, I was an early career scientist, and today, years later, I realized that a young woman scientist has really very few tools to defend herself from pressures at work and the intimidations. Nevertheless, it was a very formative experience for me. With my obstinacy and hard study, I increased my self-confidence and went on deeply believing in what I was doing. And if I look back and see what has been built in 15 years, I cannot believe my eyes. Today, geoethics is a true scientific discipline with a dedicated journal with values, methods, tools, and above all, a new vision for the future and not only for geosciences. Yeah, thank you for sharing this experience, Sylvia, because um, I think that in the process of engaging and empowering and inspiring girls and more women to pursue STEM fields, we also have to be transparent about and sharing with them some of the struggles that we run in our careers. And I think sharing this experience is important because maybe other women are being bullied or are going through other type of struggles like sexual harassment. And it's important to speak up and, and it's important to look for your rights, not your rights and, and who can protect you. And, and then uh, as I always said, if I love what I'm doing, who are you to tell me I should leave yes. this field, right? And, yeah. um, indeed. Um, another question that I have, because you have a fascinating background is, you once told me that music is one of your favorite hobbies and that yes. music serves your spiritual part while science serves your rational part. Can you please elaborate a little bit about that? Yes, music has occupied a large part of my life in the past. I studied the 
piano uh, since I was a child and then uh, singing a little older. I was member of choirs, uh, first amateur and later professional. Uh, I have been a soloist for musical groups and with music I paid only also for my university studies. Today music is just a hob hobby for me, but uh, it remains a great pleasure for my soul. My musical tastes have uh, also changed, but uh, what, has, uh, what has remained intact in me is the uh, ease with which the emotion of music involves me, an emotion both physical and spiritual, but always direct, which does not cross my mind. However, mm -hmm. reflecting on this point, I can say that uh, there is no clear separation between the two spheres, uh, geology and music uh, in my life. In reality, even music and making music as an important rational component. In the same way, geology is also capable of making us encounter our deepest uh, spiritual dimension. Geology mm -hmm. makes we travel in time, trains our mind to imagine uh, boundless spaces compared to those in which we usually move. It is able to make us perceive the space and the time and even ourselves, our position in the universe. And in this sense, it also has to do with our most intimate dimension. Uh, the geological environment, mountains, rocks, rivers are concrete elements in a continuous transformation uh, and their vision transmits has the force of the earth, which originates in the depth of the core and the mantle, which shapes matter, rises mountains, sculpts the, the reliefs. A small part of that primordial energy that gave rise to the whole universe and is the same energy that flows in us, humans. In these terms, I feel that geology has to do with our spirituality in this term. Very good point. Now, you once told me that it is important for you to know your ideals. Why? Well, I, I think in any activity we are engaged in, we must put passion, competence, dedication, accuracy in work. Uh, success is less important th than responsibility for what we do. And for this reason, we must always ask ourselves what we want from life, what we really believe in, what are our ideals, values, aspirations and needs. Unfortunately, we are not always free to decide for our present and future. There are family superstructures, uh, social dynamics, uh, uh, cultural pressures that can divert us from our life project. And many people are forced to make certain choices due to the difficult, uh, difficulties uh, economic uh, of their life. Life can be really unjust, but um, I think that inside ourselves, the desire, the hope to improve our condition must never go out. Honestly, I don't think we are happy where we are carefree, thoughtless. This happens in our youth when our desires, our passions and goals are still unclear. Instead, happiness is much more complex. It means being inside our own individual life project, social and, pro and professional project. It is, for example, doing our job well, feeling useful to others, feeding the passion for utopia. It is putting energy into existential work and social projects. My commitment to geoethics tries to connect these various 
dimensions of my life, professional, social, environmental. And, and this is perhaps a utopia, but it is my way of trying to be happy. All right. Well, I want to thank the three panelists uh, for today's um, input, insights, and tips. Right now, we're going to open the floor for any participant to ask questions to our three panelists. Uh, considering we had a, you know, a bombing kind of a crusher situation earlier, um, in order for you to ask a question, just raise your hand. As you know, there is um, you know, uh, there is an option in which you can raise your hand, and that way the IT uh, technician person can actually unmute you, and you can ask directly the question to the panelists. Um, okay. In the meantime, oh, we have, we have yeah, already. I did. Yeah, I've been unmuted as well. I have two questions, one for Ezra and one for Sylvia. And for Ezra, I just wanted to ask her, what, I mean, what would she advise or how does she see age as an issue in women, you know, um, attaining success in their careers, especially those that have kind of changed careers from one field to another, uh, particularly from any other field to GIS or the STEM fields, how do you see age being an obstacle or a factor? Do you think you know, it's something and what would you advise as a way to you know, uh, overcome this? And for Sylvia, I'm really kind of um, uh, uh, partly inspired by your story, especially the challenges and you know, the attack that you, the harassment and assault really that you, you know, had to um, endure in the hands of your senior colleagues. Uh, what would make the inspiration full would be if you share how you were able to survive that, how you were able to overcome that, what were the tricks that you used to keep going, because it couldn't, add, I, I can imagine it wasn't easy, wasn't, couldn't have been an easy experience, you know, so what were the, 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 the tools you were you you used to help you overcome that uh, very difficult, challenging uh, period. Thank you. Okay, who wants to start? Okay, Sylvia, please. It's Azura. You're welcome. Okay, should I take the floor? Yes, uh, the first question was for you, right? Uh, okay, uh, thank you, uh, Onya. I think the age should not be an obstacle to change the, from, from, from one field to another. Uh, maybe the main challenge will be to find a scholarship if you would like to go out uh, abroad in a, in a in a research laboratory in order to to or a training uh, uh, laboratory on in another university in the at the international level maybe scholarship will be difficult to find but in geoscience, we could help as African Association of Women in Geoscience, especially um, we, can, we, we could accompany uh, the women that would like to change the field. We could also participate to their training. We could also, uh, if, we, if they would like to, to make, for example, a PhD thesis, we could collaborate. Uh, there is no problem for that. We did it uh, many times and we are ready to do it. We have uh, in our group, we have uh, women from different fields uh, related to geoscience and also GIS. GIS is a tool that we could use in all uh, uh, geoscientific field. Um, I think there are many opportunities also for uh, let me see, for example, in Belgium, I, we have uh, already supported uh, uh, a Moroccan geoscientist that did four, that did four 
months in Belgium, and she's a good GIS scientist now. Uh, we have also we in my in my uh, faculty we have uh, two people working with GIS. If you need any help, so just let me know, and uh, maybe Anna could give you my email. Uh, sure. You are from which country? You are from which country? Oh yeah, thank you. I'm I'm originally Nigerian, but I'm based in the UK now. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Yes, there are quite of uh, networks and resources um, that I'm aware um, in the Southern Hemisphere. So um, I think it's a matter of uh, connecting uh, with the right folks and, and, and figuring out what are the resources. But definitely there are a lot of collaborations, uh, North, South Hemisphere, and even um, USAID, which is uh, the equivalent of foreign ministry or foreign affairs in the United States, uh, they do have a funding mechanism called PEER, where uh, an African scientist or researcher partners with an American, but uh, if they get the grant, 100% of the funding goes to the African researcher or academician. So um, if anyone in this uh, panel uh, or attendees want to know more about those funding opportunities for Southern Hemisphere researchers, please uh, let us know. Uh, Sylvia, I think that the could second I, question was for you. Could uh, I add something? Yeah, sure. Um, there is an African association, there is an international association, but they have also an African um, chapter dealing with GIS and remote sensing. Uh, they, they, are, they, they are organizing many trainings um, uh, at the international level also through, through Africa. So I could also share the, 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 the website of the, this association, which is really dealing with GIS and remote sensing. So it's a specialized uh, association. Very good. Thank you. Good to know. Yes, Sylvia? Uh, Sylvia, thank you for your question. <laughs> uh, no tricks, <laughs> no, no strange things. Uh, my tricks was to study a lot, to study a lot, to prepare myself at the best of my possibilities, uh, to publish articles, to start to publish, to, to contact other people, to share my view, to share my, my vision of, uh, of uh, the, the, the matter. And uh, fortunately, I got also the help of many colleagues. I'm really grateful to them, in particular to, uh, to some prominent professors all over the world who received the emails from uh, from him and took my side, advised me, supported and defended me. And with their help, they fortified my self-confidence and pushed me to go ahead, deeply believing in what I was doing and not letting myself be intimidated. Um, I think each person with his action, with his or her actions, can make the difference. And those professors and colleagues became the core of aggregation of many other colleagues interested in my scientific activity, on which to build a network of people who strongly believe in, in values such as honesty, respect, trust, and... Um, who, and above all, who put in practice values they talk about. This is the, the important things to be credible, to be credible. Thank you. Important. Thank you so much, uh, Sylvia, to, uh, for sharing that delicate um, uh, experience because those kind of barriers or struggles, it, it's hard to open up and, and, and share them with others, right? Uh, unfortunately, I think um, still when there is a sexual harassment case, still women being, uh, you know, 
uh, perceive as the trouble, you know what I mean? And um, and I think we need to really open up and, and share uh, these struggles with other women because they might run into a similar situation, you know, and not everything is glorious uh, in the STEM fields. And that's why we still uh, a, a minority. Uh, so uh, a question, a brief question that I have for Stephanie. Stephanie, do you actually work with developing countries? Are you uh, doing anything uh, like sharing that book, your book uh, with girls or, or females in, in uh, outside of the United States? Um, I've had a few conversations with a few people in different countries, Croatia, Japan, mm -hmm. um, different places, but um, it's predominantly in the States as well as, well, I should say in North America. So Canada, mm -hmm. Mexico, United States. Mm. Well, I wonder if one of these days, maybe you will contemplate the idea of translating your book to French or other languages. And maybe we could partner with like a network, you know, uh, like regional networks and maybe expose that book to more middle school girls and high school girls and we can inspire and engage more into this film. yeah um, i actually have thought about that so it, we'll we'll see <laughs> Perfect. I, I could i could help uh, for if you would like to translate your book to french i could do it for you <laughs> wow oh my gosh there we go you got the translators the money <laughs> A very high up level translator. <laughs> oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much, ladies. Uh, we're going to move into the next part of the event. I want to thank you all. Uh, let me introduce you to Dr. Neiruka Onia, CEO and co founder of Lenke Space and Water Solutions in the United Kingdom, who will present the photo and video contest along with Mary. Thank you, Anna. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Anna. Um, thank you to all the panelists. It's been a very insightful session this evening. Um, the benefits of networking, we all know, um, is manifold in good times, and it becomes even more relevant during adversity. One important benefit of networking is the opportunity it gives to individuals to develop their careers and also to <laughs> their professional, personal, and social, you know, support network. This year, our photo contest was aimed at encouraging us to reflect back on the difficult year we've had and appreciate and acknowledge the support we have received from our networks. We, we believe that, you know, whether you are what, regardless of the level of, um, you know, you've attained in life professionally or personally, we can all benefit uh, from our networks, either by inspiring others or becoming um, inspired by others. There's always the opportunity to learn. And our participants this year understood the aim, and this is really evidenced in the submissions that were entered. So uh, we'll call on Mary now to introduce our top five entries for the, comp uh, for the photo contest this year. Hi, everyone. The different entries for this year's photo contest were very brilliant and inspirational. And we selected our top five finalists. The first person, the first photo that was chosen in this category was Mary Ewokolo Moloa Mua Etutu. Mary is from Cameroon. She is a recent holder of PhD from the University of Boya. She is passionate about geology and most importantly, introducing geospatial data to younger generations. Her photo and little video will show what she has for us today. Hello, my name is Mary Iwokulumulwambua Etutu, a recent holder of the PhD in Applied Geology from the University of Boya, Cameroon. I love nature and have a passion for geology. I am particular about knowledge dissemination 
in the fields of geology to the younger generation, especially when it comes to the application of new and advanced digital technologies in different areas related to the geosciences. My photos best describe a geologic woman in the academia. In this slide, we accompany students to the field, teach them how to carry out geologic mapping, including rock descriptions, as well as descriptions and identification of geologic structures. At the end of the exercise, the students are guided on how to produce geologic maps using different remote sensing and GIS softwares. Thank you. Our next, the, the second person that was selected as the panel, by the, by the panel as the, one of the five um, final, uh, was a Fai Elder Queen Bongsisai from Cameroon, University of Bamenda, Cameroon, going to the field with pregnancy. She brought out the fact that women can do it and you should not limit yourself because you're pregnant or because of any other thing. Her photos and video describes what she did. Hi everyone, my name is Fai Edel Queen Bonsisi. I decided to take part in the photo contest because I want female geoscientists to know that you can actually go to the field no matter your situation. I went to the field when I was seven months pregnant. This was due to the fact that I was always working against time as a result of COVID-19 restrictions in my country. The objectives of my field work was to pan stream sediments in order to recover gold grains <coughs> and other heavy metals in which I will use the data to defend my PhD thesis. Luckily enough for me, I got help from workers of Geocam Gosal Exploration Company in the field where sampling points were located, the clay rich sediments we are collected in order to recover the stream sediments which contain the gold and other heavy metals. In photo A, I am with workers of the Geocam Gosal Exploration Company. In photo B, we are trying to collect the clay rich sediments in order to pan the stream sediments. In photo C, I am doing the panning. In photo Z, I'm trying to collect the clay sediments and the last photo, that's the stream sediments that we were panning. My study area was very vast and I couldn't have done it. I, I couldn't have carried out this field work successfully without the help of those workers. Thanks very much. Our third picture for the top five photo contest pictures was Hi. from Dr. Laura Daniel Robert Sun from Canada, Dr. Gopika Sures from Germany, Dr. Sarah Bang from Canada. They, they are organizers of Sisters of SAR initiative. They promote women in their fields and make them more visible. They organize trainings for universities, colleges, and organizations like NASA and others. And they have a website which we could follow to know more about them. Your yeah, picture and photo follow. Yes. I'm Sarah Banks, and I'm a physical scientist at Environment and Climate Change Canada, as well as a PhD student at Carleton University. I am Dr. Laura Dingle Robertson, and I am a physical scientist at Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada. And I'm Dr. Gopika Suresh, and I'm a research scientist at the Federal Agency for Cartography and Geodesy in Frankfurt, Germany. And we are the organizers of the Sisters of SAR initiative. With Sisters of SAR, we aim to showcase and promote women in our field and make more women visible. And that is what our photo represents. 
We are active on Twitter following a weekly schedule, including SARFAC Monday, Diversity Day Wednesday, Training Tuesday, Picture Day Thursday, and our Pride, SAR Star Friday, where we feature a woman in SAR. We develop training material for universities, colleges, and organizations like NASA and ESA to encourage uptake by a diverse audience. We also run a website where people can find training resources, keep up to date with some of the latest news, opportunities, and events relevant to the SAR community. On our SAR Stars page, you'll find details of the women in SAR that we have showcased till date, which are more than 80. This forms a sort of database to find speakers, potential mentors, supervisors, and a network. We hope to make every woman in SAR visible and amplify their voices, and that is what we aim to show in our photo. Professionally, I'm supported by close colleagues in SAR who teach and challenge me every day. Through Sisters of SAR, Ladies of Landside, and other such initiatives in our field, I've met so many inspirational women who constantly support me and empower me. As a student, I had the opportunity to work with Dr. Heather McNairn, who I learned a lot from and always felt supported and inspired by. We hope to keep our force strong and we appreciate the opportunity. The fourth picture chosen for our top five photo contest finalists, we have Ngwa Mangui Fortuna Ngwa Ngume from Cameroon, the University of Bamenda. She shares a story with her friend going for sightseeing and what she learned wire for the sightseeing. So on the photo above, I and my friend, we decided to go for sightseeing in our area. The place that we decided to visit was the hills. It's actually from, it's located at the east side of our university, of the University of Bamenda in Cameroon. Though the place was bushy, we still managed to create our own way, passing through farms to go and meet, to go and visit the area. So as we went to the area, we saw the hills. It had shown that the site has been eroded. It had undergone erosion. The rock was really an old rock. It wasn't looking like a fresh sample. It felt that old sample. And since it was too high, we couldn't see the other sites, but the rock had undergone processes of erosion and weathering. And the feet present on our top five photo contest winners are Mostura, Mistura Moibi Tijani from Nigeria. She put up some of the activities she has been carrying out with female students and youths of her country, most often advancing STEM in her community. So there's going to be a lot of economic divide between the halves, those people that have, and those people that do not have, which will eventually lead to widespread technological unemployment. You have the students at this stage to make sure that you won't be in the category of those that will fall between computer and your education, your self determination, and then also to expand the interest of female students in technological advancement. I'm a lady now. So, as a female, you can thrive as an engineer. Now, coming from an underserved community, does not mean that one cannot be successful. Both using computers to reason, process data, analyze data, complete tasks that were traditionally done by lawyers. I mean, it's power. I can say electrical power. This one is like a buzzer. Mm, buzzer is close to like a control part, like one that controls the system. So, for example, now in an engineering design, you have different perspectives. Also, mechanical parts, who cooks, aluminum foil. 
So aluminum foil is a good conductor of electricity. Do you order this material? By the time you put this material inside water, you know it will come out. Because if you organize that, organize this uh, program, are you students who decided not to come? Pay three goes up to every one of you that are here. So you know, this program, we want more of us. Uh, God will bless you. Amen. God will increase you. Amen. You will not go down. Amen. Uh, and you will live long for us. Amen. Amen. Okay, thank you very much, Mary, for that presentation. I'm sure that the audience will agree with me that those were very interesting and inspiring um, photos showing how people have utilized their networks during the period of the pandemic and um, a challenging period for globally, essentially. So we're now going to announce the winners. In third place is um, Dr. Mary Etutu, can you uh, first and please show the photo, the, win the third place photo? So thank you very much, Mary, for this, and you've won the third place. Um, in second place is engineer Mr. Muyibi Tijani. And in, third, in the first prize, uh, winners are uh, Drs. Laura Gopika and Sarah, the sisters of Sa. A round of applause for them. Thank you very much. We would like to have your email addresses um, so that we can communicate with you on how you receive your prizes. Thank you very much. And I hand over to Anna now for the conclusion. Thank you. Thank you. What a lovely set of photos and stories. So I want to thank all the panelists, Professor Erami, Stephanie Spy, and Dr. Pepoloni for their outstanding tips, insights, and for sharing their backgrounds and struggles with all the attendees today. I feel as uh, new ideas and resources have been shared in this panel and folks are more aware of existing networks, especially in uh, the Southern Hemisphere. I want to thank the team behind this panel because it was quite of uh, a team effort. Um, this is just the first of two panels planned for this year. So please uh, stay tuned and check the following announcements and recordings in this link that I'm gonna post um, in the chat room. Um, thank you everyone. And we'll be in touch. Please uh, send all those resources and networks and ideas that have been discussed today in this panel, because I think it'll be lovely to start assembling like a, 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 a soup page of resources huh, for this group. And maybe we can start building a larger network and partner with other existing networks of women in STEM fields. Thank you all. And I wish you a lovely day. Thank you to you. Thank you, Anna. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Bye-bye.